I was convinced by YouTube to buy into S&P Global. So I'll explain to you why in this video. So in a recent survey by public.com, investors are evolving alongside the markets with an increasing focus on research and diligence. From the 1,000 users that did the survey, 43% of them said that they will go to social media for information and ideas. So I know that the sample size here might be a little bit biased, but I would like to know from you in the comments below whether this is the same observation you'll experience amongst your own friends that do invest as well. So what percentage of them go onto social media platforms for information? So personally, I am subscribed to at least 500 different finance creators, both from an information gathering perspective and a competitor analysis point of view. Specifically for S&P Global, I think one of the biggest advocates for this investment idea is actually from this bigger YouTuber called Joseph Carlson. So unlike real life where there's a penalty for actually copying others in the examinations, it's completely legal in the investing world. Heck, there is even a term for it, it's called cloning. So one such avenue of cloning is where investors actually take a look at the 13F filings or disclosures by different super investors. Basically, the really, really smart people managing a lot of money like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, etc. So when I look into the latest filing and rank the stock by ownership count, S&P Global was actually ranked 36 with 9 out of 80 super investors owning them in their current portfolio according to Data Roma. So on a similar note, one of S&P Global's main competitor in the ratings business is actually Moody's. And Moody's was ranked 13, with 14 out of 80 super investors having a stake in them. So I think we are getting onto something here. Why is there a particular obsession with this type of companies amongst some of the smartest in the industry? So I think it comes down to one word. It's called smashing the like button. Okay, my apologies, that's four words to be exact. But the one word is predictability. So when you look at S&P Global, the easiest way I can summarize their business is that they are a core enabler of the modern financial system. So first, they provide data and analytics for different players in the financial industry. They answer to the passive investing crowd via their indexing services, and they rate the credit worthiness of businesses so that they can raise debt in the financial markets today. So on the point on predictability, S&P Global has fed spectacularly well on a few counts. In the last 10 years, they have essentially grew their top line sales by more than 160% and operating income by more than 170%. So this was also reflected by the very, very healthy increase in dividend payout to early investors of S&P Global from $1.12 per share in 2013 to $3.60 per share in 2023. So this was more than a 3x increase and just take a look at how shareholders are enjoying the fruits of S&P Global's competitive advantage. So for SPGI, their strength in the financial markets was also reflected through this very nice share price appreciation as market participants are very excited about both their business prospects and also how they have executed thus far. So in the last 10 years, from January 2013 to December of 2022, SPGI had appreciated by more than 500%. So I think we don't have to further make the case that SPGI has been a compounding gem over the last decade or so. However, the important thing for most investors today is how this company is going to perform in the upcoming decade, not the past decade. Weibo is back with something even more amazing. So they've decided to extend their upsize sign-up campaign for new users until the end of this month, 30th of November. So new users to Weibo can now create, fund, and maintain any amount in their Weibo account for 30 days and win 10 fractional shares worth between 100 to 5,000 US dollars. So if you sign up on your own, you will only be entitled to two free shares. So remember to sign up with the link below now. Also, if you intend to sharpen your investing knowledge, you can explore Weibo's Learning Center. At here, you'll be able to take advantage of Weibo's in-house trade features, but also learn more about the different investment strategies to enrich your investing and also trading knowledge. So you can head over to the Markets tab click on to learn and you have access to a myriad of different articles and lessons from beginner all the way to the expert level. So you can even participate in their one point a day campaign to make sure that you are learning something new every single day. And since everything is on the same app, you can put what you learn into practice immediately. So for those without a Weibo account, I don't know what you're waiting for. Sign up with the link below now. 
Thank you, Weibo, for sponsoring this video. So let's take a look at a few tailwinds around S&P Global's main businesses today. First, S&P Global actually runs an oligopoly alongside Fitch and Moody's in the credit ratings industry. So an oligopoly is basically when a market has very, very limited competition and the market share is essentially shared amongst a small number of players. So the big three, which is Moody's, Fitch and S&P Global, currently controls around 95% of the entire credit ratings industry. So I don't see this competitive dynamics breaking down anytime soon. And it is close to impossible for a new competitor without any prior expertise and brand equity to snatch any meaningful market share from them. Therefore, this high barriers to entry and network effect will enable them to continue harvesting all the premiums and profits in the ratings business. But the second part of this equation is whether there'll be an increasing demand for the ratings services. So to me, I see the credit industry as a long-term secular trend with a slight cyclical twist. So that's a lot of English words to digest, but let me try to explain. Essentially, I think this trend towards raising capital from the financial markets will only intensify as there's a lot more competition, strengthening the long-term secular growth trend. However, let's not forget that underlying this entire thing is the business cycle underpinning all this. And the credit business will take a hit in the down cycle. As always, this down cycle would not be a structural issue, but a short-term one instead, as history has proven itself. So on top of the ratings business, the second part is really this idea of data analytics and on the intelligence front. So we tend to hear about data being the new all in the coming decade. So to me, Data itself will slowly turn into a commodity as it proliferates. So the long-term trend lies on who is able to gather insights and make sense of the underlying data. The one that most accurately predict and provide actionable guidance. So S&P Global has been one of the most trusted sources in this financial space. And I don't expect their customers to switch over to their competitors anytime soon. So to many clients in the financial space, access to S&P Global services are considered normal business expense. So here's a fun fact. For those of you who actually use Capital IQ, which is one of the flagship products S&P Global has, where anyone spots any mistakes from their platform, um, they're willing to pay the person for spotting their mistake. I would definitely be more worried if S&P Global actually stays complacent and think that their dominance is guaranteed. So on this topic of maintaining S&P Global's economic mode, they've announced in early 2022 that they have completed the acquisition of IHS Market, which is a $140 billion merger. So in their words, it's, and I quote, it's creating a leading information service provider with a unique portfolio of highly complementary assets. So these products allow us to better serve out customers with a broader and deeper portfolio of unique solutions and increased scale, unquote. So there's a lot of technical jargons and mumbo jumbo, but in short, just know that they definitely are scaling up and diversifying their offers and revenue stream, while at the same time trying to expand and stuff out competitors. So on the topic of whether it's anti-competitive, I'll actually leave it up to the regulators. Who am I to judge? So S&P Global actually acquired IHS in an all-stock deal worth $44 billion, including a $4.8 billion of net debt. So when looking at IHS 2021 figures, they actually delivered revenue of around $4.65 billion and net income of around $1.2 billion. So that means that S&P Global paid around a 9.5 times price to sales and 36.6 times price to earnings. So usually, this sort of major acquisition will be transacted at a level of premium due to this very fanciful term of synergies. But I think rather than relying on these stories that are told by Wall Street bankers that have a potential conflict of interest, numbers don't lie. So we should actually observe how the synergies actually play out in the upcoming few quarters. And also, because of this recent acquisition, they've significantly increased their outstanding shares. But on the bright side, um, they are buying back shares aggressively to undo this dilution. Moreover, as they have to take on the outstanding debt from IHS, their capital structure might be slightly skewed, although still manageable. So their current ratio is now under one um, due to the short-term liabilities being extended, but they can still clear all their debt in right around three years with their current free cash flow generative abilities. 
However, my biggest ache around S&P Global's assets today is the very bloated goodwill that was a result of this acquisition. So to many accountants, um, intangible assets and goodwill is probably considered bullshit assets. So although I do acknowledge that a large part of S&P Global's moat comes from their current network and brand equity, but having $52 billion of the $60 billion in assets parked under goodwill and other intangible assets means that we need to work extra hard as shareholders to keep track of essentially how quote-unquote valuable this intangible asset is from quarter to quarter. Are they able to continue delivering growth? Are they able to continue maintaining their margins? Now, I think the biggest bad thesis against S&P Global today is their valuations. So SPGI is currently expected to grow their top line revenue by around 5-8% to in the coming 3 years, while earnings growing slightly faster at around 12-15%. to So with the current growth estimates, SPGI is actually trading at around 33 times forward price to earnings and 39 times price to free cash flow. And they currently have a dividend yield of less than 0.9%. So to some investors, it might be too hard a pill to swallow, especially when you're paying such a high multiple for such a low growth company, relatively speaking. So when compared to its historical averages, they had a PE multiple of right around 25 to 28 times. So it is normal to think that S&P Global is overvalued today. So for me, SPGI is a starter position at less than a 1% allocation. So I initially entered into the position because I wanted exposure to the ratings and data industry, and also because I wanted to monitor the stock more closely. If I know I have no skin in the game, um, I probably will sleep on this stock. I'm having a hard time to justify buying in big at current valuations, but I think that quality companies are always going to trade at a premium most of the time. So I'll be more than excited to accumulate shares when some of these bear theses like a recession comes into fruition takes place and the share price actually corrects downwards. On the flip side, I'm actually looking forward to SPGI's continued efforts to diversify and also expand their reach in the entire financial markets today and how they're able to convert them into numbers in the financial statements. So if you're asking me where I think it's a good price to accumulate, I think that whenever there are recessionary scares, just like the one in 2022, it's always a good time to scoop up these high quality compounders that are hit with the market cyclicality argument. So I do think that companies like S&P Global should be trading at a premium, but it might be hard to get them at dirt cheap valuations. For now, I'm an observer with a very, very, very tiny exposure waiting for the next opportunity to swing. With that, I'll see you in the next video, but more importantly, I will finally see you on the moon. Goodbye.